It's probably like nuclear fusion, you know, you ask people when will the first nuclear fusion power be available and the answer is always in 50 years time. And the answer is, and when will there be genuinely intelligent machines? Well, I might be very wrong here, but some, some optimists say, oh, within 10 years, I would say, well, maybe it's 50 years, or maybe it will always be 50 years, I just do not know. Turing was fascinated with the idea of how intelligent could you make a machine be. The imitation game itself was a game Turing devised to what test for? Yes, the idea was that if you're <laughs> at the other end of a telephone line and you've got a, I think in those days of course it was a teletype or a dumb terminal, you know, and you type questions at something and the answer comes back and if after an agreed period of time uh, you're then asked, was that a human you were talking to, or was it a machine? If you can't decide that it's not human, then it's past the test, it's masqueraded as a human. I think what he realised all along, was perhaps teasing us a little, and it's always seemed to me, is that with a limited bandwidth for interaction like that, it's very probably one of Turing's own undecidable problem. You can't get enough information to come to a rational decision as to whether it's a human or a machine. But this doesn't stop there being, I think, is this right, there's a yearly competition now. They normally give scores like, you know, 60% thought it was human, 40% thought it was machine, and the answer is, it's machine, and stuff like that. To me, you see, it really is, a, as I was saying, a case of undecidability. If you need to visit the other end of the line and see whether there's somebody typing in teletype to come to a decision. But then, of course, that spoils the whole nature of the test. It was a topic that fascinated Turing and, and one that he really, really cared about. And it's interesting, had he lived, I'd love to know what he makes of the present day artificial intelligence scene and just what is easy to do in the AI field and what is hard. And my own observation, and I'm not an expert, so I fully expect to be put in my place and told how wrong I am, is that the, the computer could do a fixed task in a narrow domain very differently to a human and be superb at it. Example, chess. Absolutely superb example. I think Deep Blue beat Kasparov way back when, but it absolutely did not use the pattern matching analysis type thing that a grandmaster would do. It's brute force, you know? Uh, the, the whole game tree, as it were, of chess. If I do this, then do that, then do that. I mean, your average chess player might be able to look six or seven moves ahead over all possibilities. Blessed deep blue can go, pff, Lord knows how many moves ahead. And actually, this I think is um, is is a good exemplar of this because what. <clears throat> grandmasters were missing and actually what I think Ken Thompson's chess machine Bell helped to fill in is he, I think he did all five piece endings or something like that and the ones that the grandmasters didn't know about because they needed tons of look ahead I think this is right is the ones where you absolutely do something stupid you go miles away and, and the, the rest of them say, don't do that, no, no, you don't do that. This machine's stupid, it's going to lose, it's going to lose, you know. And then right at the very end, a tiny little thing that nobody had noticed and from the absolute depths of near defeat, he suddenly finds a sneaky little way to make this pawn do that and that and that. Before you know where you are, it has squeaked a narrow victory in only 10,000 moves or something like that. You know, I'm exaggerating, but you get the idea that it's those where you would have to go miles away from the solution into an area where a human would say, there's no hope, it's everything's lost, but it isn't. There's a sneaky little alleyway through to getting a victory. That's the kind of thing that a machine can do that a human can't. But then the other side of that is the travelling salesman problem, where there are so many possibilities, but a human would just look at a map and go, well, I'm going to try that. Well, there is a connection there. It's an interesting one, too. You're quite right that it's one of these classic NP-complete problems. You know, it is believed that there is no way to get the perfect answer than simply to look at every single possibility. And the monumental way the combinations of those add up is just mind-boggling. However, what <clears throat> I think people in the field will tell you is there is a very good set of algorithms which will give you a pretty darn good answer even though it might not be absolutely perfect. And that's the difference it's between, you know, good enough within five or six percent of the best versus must be absolutely the best route.
And so that, that kind of brings me back around to the whole human versus computer Turing thing, which mm. is if I'm on the end of the phone or the teletype and I say, I don't know, what colour is music? Yeah. This is the problem about that Turing test game, you know, you could get either end of the uh, equation trying to play silly games. I think there was a programme called Parry, probably invented, was it at Stanford? Somewhere in America. Parry uh, was going to replicate the speech patterns of a paranoid schizophrenic, you see. And you can imagine, if you're up against that and you don't know whether the other end is actually a real schizophrenic person or a program simulating that behavior. That is far harder to tell the difference on because, you know, you, you ask some perfectly uh, ordinary question like, what is two plus two? I don't know why you're focusing on two. It's my hated number and all this kind of stuff. It makes it very, very difficult to start saying that is a human, but one with a, a mental problem versus that is a program that's simulating that sort of thing. So I think it's, it's the thing that AI always runs into, is this, that getting a partway answer, but by very different routes than a human would, and giving you enough information about navigating through a town to be useful, it's fine. It's when you start wanting total perfection and fantastic subtlety that things fall apart. Because that's the thing as well, the <laughs> ambiguity that yeah. humans are accustomed to, and the idea of inflection and tone being oh, key. Yeah. So for instance, okay Google, how do you pronounce something in Hungarian? Here is your translation. So it's given us the word for something in mm. Hungarian, and bless it, it's told us that you pronounce it like this. Follow me. Follow me. But I'm being more general about this. I want to know how Hungarians pronounce things. I'm, I'm being yeah. ambiguous, I suppose. Yeah. Things like ambiguity and use of... Um, Similes and metaphors uh, is a classic for throwing things off. There's a, there's a real classic from the 70s, I think it is, is you know. Uh, OK, artificial intelligence program. Analyse the difference between time flies like an arrow and fruit flies like a banana. <laughs> now, that's a beauty because, you know, time flies like an arrow, it's a simile and all this kind of thing, extension of a metaphor. But on the other hand, the other one which on the surface has got a very similar grammatical structure, time flies is a noun phrase, like, ah, oh, it's not like you're being used in the simile sense, it's like is enjoy, and they're clearly eating a banana, you say. Now, it's that kind of subtlety and that kind of knowledge of how the real world works allied to syntactic analysis. That's what you and I use all the time, you know, and what computer systems would find so very, very difficult. Because, of course, you're inviting the computer program to sort of say, hey, there must be a thing called a time fly, and they live on an exclusive diet of arrows. <laughs> and yet we know that's impossible. So, you see, we're using that kind of knowledge over this whole domain of what the real world is like in order to disambiguate between those two. All the successes of artificial intelligence tend to be in narrow domains, you know, if you're, um, like I say, playing chess is one example. There's a thing they did at Stanford, uh, mycin, I think it was, about uh, antibiotics and their effect. And the great advantage, of course, with a, uh, with a computer is if it is all done by logic, then it will do it and it will not get tired and it will not usually make mistakes unless you're counting up Gangnam style hits. But that's the point. You know, you don't get bored, you don't make mistakes if you're a computer. So therefore, that's why they often outperform humans. Roger Penrose, a very famous mathematician at Oxford, got really rather hot under the collar about all this. I think he wrote a book called Something Like the Emperor's New Mind had a real go at artificial intelligence. Basically said, the trouble is you're assuming that the human brain is just like a very complex Turing machine. Well, I am convinced it's more than that. I, Roger Penrose, think there are quantum effects. And if only my neurological medical friends would tell me how to find them and how to categorize them, I might be able to tell you more about the computational model that is really going on in the human brain. But I've not read anything about that recently, so it's on the to-do list, I think. friendly environment by enveloping it around the agent in question. Kilometer, and every time that had got up to nine, it would nudge the dial to the left of it to move on one place. So it gets stuck in what's called a local maximum or a local minimum. On the left will be two to the power zeros.